Thank you very much. Um, I'm, I must say that um, my first reaction to uh, watching those presentations uh, is that the quality of their presentation visually is so much better than mine, maybe I should just give up at this point. But I am going to go through um, uh, an update on what has happened uh, in the UK in the last uh, 12 months. Because we have negotiated with the government, with the UK government, something called a sector deal for the creative industries. And I want to try and explain what that means. But first of all, uh, we should note in passing that we have a birthday. Because 2018 is actually the 20th anniversary of the first mapping, conceptualization, classification, whatever word you want to use, of the creative industries. 1998 was the date, so it's a 20th uh, anniversary this year. These are some of the uh, other landmarks in the chronology of events in the development of speaking and understanding uh, the creative industries. Um, and I want, in passing, before I come to the, the events of the last year, um, just to note the enormously um, generous, I think, role that the British Council has played in exporting, or sharing is a better word, the idea and understanding of the creative economy and the creative industries. And the British Council has done three or four complementary things. It's arranged events like this. It's helped to form partnerships. But what it's also done is to produce resources and texts, which are pieces of analysis about what the creative economy is, uh, and shared them and made them available. And what you can see uh, behind me uh, is the first of those landmark texts. This is a publication which was written by John Newbegin. Is you, are you still here, John? Ah, there you are. So John wrote this, and it was published in 2010. Even better, right. We have it in Russian. You can't say better than that, but it, even better than that, John, because he's an immensely generous and hardworking man, updated it. So I don't think the new version is in Russian, but this is the first page of the updated text on the creative economy. So you can see, uh, you can see from the table of contents what the subject matter is, definitions, new business models, skills, relationship with the digital world, hubs, clusters, etc. I'm not going to say any more except to say that this is available online to anybody who wants to see it. And then I'm just going to mention another text in passing. This is also a British Council publication, collection of essays, which is edited by Andy Pratt. Andy, stand up and take a bow. This man is the world's leading expert on creative clusters, and I'm his agent. And this publication is also available online. So one of the roles, just one of the roles that the British Council has played over the years and continues to play is to make available throughout the world uh, resources to help uh, discuss the concepts uh, that we're here to talk about today. Now, um, back in 1998, when we first talked about the creative industries, there was something known as the DCMS-13, but in 2007, the uh, classification used by our culture department was modified, and we now talk about the DCMS-9, which um, are those. And this behind me now is quite possibly the most famous graphic that you will find being discussed anywhere in the UK amongst those people who are interested in statistics. So this 
is a snapshot of the creative economy in the UK. Uh, and it, it shows you very clearly the proportionality of the different subsectors. This one here is the big one and the most controversial. Uh, but actually, this one here, film and television, is especially interesting. It's growing immensely fast. But here you have the numbers, and I just want to say at this point, this website here, www.thecreativeindustries.co.uk, there are lots more graphics like this for anybody who wants to understand what's going on uh, in the UK. Now, I'm going to come to uh, the point about the politics of the last year, but the background... The background is, as we know, as we all know, and it has been referred to several times today, there is a continuing impact of what economists sometimes call the digital shift. I'm not going to go through all of this, but the impact is kind of total, really. I work in the movie business, and uh, I can tell you that the impact of technology, of what uh, the economist Joseph Schumpeter called creative destruction, at times comes quite close to destroying our business model. And we constantly have to reinvent that model to meet the challenges of uh, new distribution technologies uh, associated, for example, in Netflix, with Netflix. By the way, Netflix... This year, in 2018, has spent more in commissioning new content, film, television, than all of the Hollywood studios put together, right? That's the new boy on the block, uh, completely challenging the business model in uh, the audiovisual industries. But let me come to the point about what's happened um, in the last year. Now... A bit of context. In all of our countries, there is, a, there is a relationship in the creative sector to be understood between the state and the public sector and the private sector and the market. And it will be different, of course, in each member state and in each country depending on history and culture. You've got China at one end of the spectrum where the state produces five-year plans and you have to work within those parameters. You've got the United States at the other end of the spectrum which talks about the global free market, but where, as we know, the state is perfectly capable and does intervene very heavily when it is in the interests of promoting U.S. trade. In the middle, in Europe and the UK, we have a mixed economy where the state is important. By the way, the biggest investor in the cultural economy of the United Kingdom by far is the BBC. We have a mixed economy and we, in the last 18 months, have been trying as a sector the cultural and the creative economy have been trying to establish a position within public policy, within the way of thinking about the whole of the UK economy. We have been trying to establish recognition and endorsement for the creative sector. So what happens is something like this. At the beginning of last year, our government decided that it was going to produce an entirely new industrial strategy for the entire economy. And it launched a consultation about this. And in spite of the fact that creative industries are 7, 8, 9% of the economy, the government at the beginning of this process did not see the cultural and creative sector as a priority in terms of planning and thinking about the distribution of money for public support. It did not see that. 
the early strategy documents that came out were all about what we call STEM, science, technology, engineering, mathematics. But during a process of consultation which took place over about 15 months, the creative sector, the cultural and creative industries, largely mobilized through an organization called the Creative Industries Council. Incidentally, Kieran, the Creative Industries Council was the idea of an Irish punk rocker called Fergal Sharkey, right? Uh, Fergal had a career as a rock star, and then he, became, then he founded and became chief executive of something called UK Music. It was his idea to set up the Creative Industries Council, because what he said was, we've got a big car industry, and we have something called the Automotive Council, so we should do the same for the creative sector. Anyway, so the Creative Industries Council has lobbied to uh, establish the creative industries as a... Uh, as a priority, a strategic priority for the future of uh, the British economy. And this is uh, a summary of, therefore, what was a successful campaign to get the creative sector recognized by the government as a strategic, a strategically important sector. So in March of this year, 28th of March, it was announced by the government that there would be what it called a sector deal between the government and the creative sector. And these are some, just a few, um, of the uh, elements of that package. Um, I haven't got time to talk in detail about them, but you see I've given a, a web reference at the bottom of the page. So anybody who's interested in this kind of um, the, the public policy side of all of this um, can check that for themselves. I think this last bullet point here, however, is the point. The importance of this sector deal is really symbolic. It's not about the money. The money is not insignificant. The money that is going to go into universities for research and development in the creative sector is important. It's about 80 million pounds. But really, it's the symbolic moment of getting a government to say for the first time that this is a strategic sector of the economy that really uh, is the importance of us, uh, the important uh, point. Um, I think it tells us something about government policy in the UK. I think it tells us that there is less of a strategic focus on the arts, per se, culture, per se, than there is in the relationship that the arts and culture are now developing with technology in various uh, forms. By the way, um, this one is a special one for uh, our wonderful translators uh, and interpreters, we had a new word introduced uh, in 2018 this year, um, and that word is kreatek. It's a neologism. I don't like neologisms myself, but we have the, 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 this new word, kreatek. And there was even a big conference uh, which was organized by our Creative Industries Council called Createch 2018. A lot of big, big industrial partners, Land Rover, uh, uh, Tencent from China. So what this is all about increasingly is interrogating the relationship, the fusion between creativity and technology. And that, by the way, is not a simple or straight straightforward uh, relationship. Uh, uh, and content makers do not always get the value which they should get from the relationship between artists and creatives and big tech. Let's be clear about that. There are times when the relationship is exploitative, 
But this is going to be a big issue going forward. Um, I'm just going to finish now because I'm running out of time, however, by saying something extremely, uh, uh, something very different because I wanted to follow up. Where's Martin? Is Martin here? Great. I wanted to follow up um, on what Martin said about Hull, the city of culture, which has been. Because the point of this um, bit of the agenda is to identify what's happened over the last year. Uh, and what's happened is that we have a new city of culture proposed for the year 2021. And the winner, which was announced last December, is a city which was a great city in the medieval period through textiles and became a great city in the Industrial Revolution and is a place where the bicycle was invented and the car industry was invented and grew, but it was bombed in the Second World War. The industries went down and down and down. Unemployment went up and up and up. And then the artists in this city, and the name of the city is Coventry, got together and decided that they would reinvent Coventry. And that's what's going to happen now. The artists have got together with business people, transport people, the church. This is going to be the next city of culture, and I will end by saying that if anybody has not yet got their holidays booked for 2021, you might consider going to Coventry because it's going to be a fantastically interesting place to go to.